You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. Welcome to the Choose Fire Radio podcast. Today we have a very special episode for you, and I am so thrilled and excited to be able to bring William on, who is a moderator in our Facebook group, but he's also joining us on the show as our chief technology officer. And I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about that, but I actually wanted to rewind a little bit because this episode has so much amazing content in it. You know, and I think so many of us have this tendency to try to project our lives as these Pinterest perfect, Instagram worthy items that never have had to deal with tragedy or challenges. And frankly, life just doesn't always follow that rule book. In fact, it rarely does. William, his path to FI includes becoming a widower and raising children with special needs. You know, I think it's super easy for us to always focus on that obvious, hey, it worked right away, everything went right, and now I reached it. But that doesn't reflect the lives of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people around the world that are saying that sounds great in theory, but what does it look like to try to apply those principles to my life? You don't know the shoes that I've walked in and I would just make the case that in this episode, I think William has and can really speak to this. And to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I'm doing quite well. And and yeah, that was a really good intro. I've had the good fortune of meeting William and getting to know him this past year as a member of our community and now as a member of our team. And he is truly one of the most incredible people I've ever met. I mean, his intelligence just exudes from every pore, but it's more than that. It's how much he cares. I've never met a guy who's just there and is willing to help you at every given moment. It's a rare and special gift. I just can't wait to introduce him to the entire Choose a Buy community. And with that, William, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks. It was a great introduction. Thanks. So, William, I think what makes this conversation so interesting is you're legitimately one of the smartest guys I've ever met. And in fact, I have brought many questions to you myself that I have about maybe advanced personal finance tactics and even FI tactics. But when I was looking kind of at your bio, right, at your biography, at your personal story, your interest in personal finance only started really around 2014. Tell me about that. Yeah. So for most of my career, I did the standard max out my 401k and max out my IRA, but I really didn't put much thought or interest in finances. That was something that I had delegated off to a financial advisor and I basically dropped money on them on an annual basis to invest as they saw fit. That really changed when my wife passed away and she used to handle all of our tactical finances. So things like paying of the bills and managing of the bank accounts and the checkbooks and things like that. And when she passed away, I basically took over the day-to-day management of finances as well as the long-term management of finances. And my interest in personal finance and investing really didn't kick off until Around 2014, I saw a, it was total clickbait, uh, top 10 things to do in the new year for your finances. So, so I read it and one of the suggestions was to do an inventory of all your investments, see what the expense ratios are and see actual in dollar amounts, exactly how much you're actually spending on your money. I did that and I really had quite a shock of just how much money I was spending with my financial advisor, who at the time was Edward Jones. I was invested in a lot of high fee mutual funds and then paying a management or like an advisory fee as well. And it was just eye opening. And at that point I had gone through a lot of financial optimizations. I was doing a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that we recommend people start with the kind of low hanging fruit. I changed my phone service. I cut cable and I made a lot of optimizations, but they were all dwarfed by how much money I was annually spending on my investments. And so that's when I started 
realizing I needed to do a better job of being my own captain of my long-term investments. William, with those funds and the advisor fees that you were paying, did you have any input on the funds? Did you have any input on the direction or did you just completely outsource that? Actually, I can distinctly remember the initial meetings and then also follow-up meetings with our Edward Jones advisor at the time. And I want to be clear, I actually had two Edward Jones advisors. The first advisor actually put us on a path where we fixed some mistakes that we had or some omissions. He was the one who got us started with a term life insurance policy. He was the one who kind of consolidated. Um, I had a 401k spread across multiple employers and we consolidated that. This was around the 2000, 2002 timeframe. And I'd like a lot of folks um, had tried doing some stock picking and that really didn't turn out well. So we kind of got the house in order, but at some point, probably, I mean, after we got the house in order, I really should have spent more time learning and, and taking off the training wheels. And that just didn't happen until 2014 or so. You know, that's interesting. In, in particular, I'm thinking about the phrase taking off the training wheels because you already had more considerations than most individuals. And I'm thinking about with, with two kids that are now teenagers, but two kids with autism, there, there has to be some additional considerations when you're planning for their future. And just thinking about you as an optimized individual that even wasn't maybe thinking about your own personal finances very much at this point. Well, I'm just curious because this isn't something that I've had to look into personally, but I know that it's something that there's many, many people out there that are looking for this information. Is there any advice that you could impart to them that are in this particular situation and are wondering what is it that I don't know that I don't know in terms of preparing my kids for a safe financial future? Sure. So my personal story is somewhat different than what I would recommend someone right now who's going through that with children. So my kids were diagnosed with autism in 2005, and that was actually before the creation of what's now known as the 529 ABLE plan. Much like there's a 529 plan for education, there's a 529 plan for assisting people with special needs throughout their life. And right now, that's where I would recommend people look to at least initially, for investing into long-term help um, for their kids. So, William, how does that 529 ABLE plan work? Are there limits per year? Are there amounts that you're allowed to take out per year or up to a certain point? Who can contribute to this? This is really the heart of, of the actionable tips, right? Like people out there listening to this, undoubtedly, there are many people with children with special needs and they want to know this information. So I'd love to hear any and all details you can pass along. Sure. So there's actually two uh, main tools that I'd recommend people to use. Sorry, I only mentioned one earlier, Uh, the 529 ABLE, and then there's also a special needs trust. The 529 ABLE is relatively newer and it's easy to get started. So most states, I believe at this point, all states, now um, have 529 ABLE plans that you can enroll so long as you have a diagnosis of a disability from a doctor. The contribution limits are basically the same as a 529 education plan. You're limited by the gift tax um, limits on an annual basis of how much you can put into a 529. The withdrawal, rather than being qualified based off of being a qualified educational expense, you can withdraw money tax-free based off of a variety of criteria that include things like living expenses, adaptive training or adaptive mechanics. So if you need ramps to go into your house or if you need electronics in order to gain language, communication devices, basically there's a bunch of expenses that you can use that are qualified for a 529 ABLE plan withdrawal. Um, Money can go into that oftentimes with a state tax deduction and can grow tax-free and then withdrawn tax-free for qualified expenses. Are these all run by the states? Are there any federal tax benefits as well or any federal programs? Uh, Let's see. They are run by the states, much like the 529 education plans, but they're governed to some extent or they're legislated through at the federal level. So the federal level makes the rules or it makes a lot of the rules 
and then it's up to the states to actually implement those rules. So one right. of the most recent thing that happened with the new tax law, I believe, is that 529 education plans, money that you may have been putting into for college for your child, and then they get a diagnosis of a disability, you can now roll money over from a 529 education plan into a 529 ABLE plan, for example. And that's been a recent change. And you said earlier a, quote, diagnosis of a disability. Is there a list of disabilities, like at a federal level, that would qualify someone to be able to open one of these 529 ABLE plans? Is that something we can put in the show notes, or how does that work? Sure. It's basically the same set of disabilities as the Social Security disability programs. So yeah, uh, autism and most standard like physical as well as cognitive disabilities would apply. Question for you on the actual specifics of the tax benefit that you're getting. And and you hit on it, but I just want to make sure that I'm understanding it clearly. So based on what you said with a 529 plan, it is it's going into an account tax free at the state level only. It's not giving you a benefit at the federal level, but then you get to draw it out tax free as long as it's used for a qualified expense, which includes, as you pointed out, living and mechanical and others. And I guess there's a full on list of those. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah. So in a lot of respects, it behaves at a federal level like a Roth IRA. So you can put money in. The money that goes in is post-tax dollars. It grows. You can pull the money out as you need it and as you spend it on qualified expenses. At the state level, you get a. some states offer state income deductions for contributions you put into their 529 um, ABLE plans. Awesome. And it, it sounds like while maybe some of us are, you know, him and haw and go back and forth a little bit on the 529 for education, depending on what your strategy is, the 529 ABLE plan is an obvious choice. This is something to do. Yeah, it's a very easy first start. So even before you start talking to a lawyer or drafting up something that's much more comprehensive for, for your special needs trust, the 529 ABLE is something that you can do immediately. It also has the other a feature that's also not in the 529 education plans, but there are income limitations on Social Security disability and Medicaid admittance, and up to $100,000 of money of assets within a 529 ABLE is basically shielded from consideration for when your child actually applies to federal disability programs. So if you want to, if you have a child that has a disability and they're hit 18 and they go on to SSI, they're not going to be kicked off because of their assets if their assets are held within a 529 ABLE plan. Um, Whereas if you held it in a UGMA or like a Uniform Gift to Minors Act, basically a custodial account at your local bank, for example, those assets can be held against you or held against them when they go to apply for Social Security, disability, or Medicaid. Thank you so much. That's very, very, very useful and eye-opening for me. Uh, I have one more for you. You said that the 529s are a great place to start, you know, especially, and and you kind of pointed out that the next step being a special needs trust. Tell us a little bit more about that. What is the value? Why is it something to be considered? Give us a little bit more insight on that. The special needs trust has a couple big benefits. One, it can accept more money and shield more money than just the $100,000. So as we know, like $100,000, if you use something like the 4% rule, you can figure out that that's not going to get you very far for when you're looking at an entire lifetime of, of need, potentially. So the biggest feature of the special needs trust is the ability to shield additional money from your child so that the child can still participate on things like Social Security, Disability, and Medicaid and won't be kicked off because they are they have access to a lot of assets. Yeah, William, this was a, a question that I kind of wanted to get at more holistically. And so this is the perfect time is obviously you are in, in your situation acutely aware of mortality and you have to be thinking about these issues for your children who have autism. And someday, hopefully many, many, many decades from now, it it won't be until that point, but someday you won't be there. They're going to have to navigate this world and navigate finances. How does someone approach that just from point one? We can talk about the special needs trust, of course, because I think it's, it's integral to it. But 
how do they approach that? So if someone's listening to this, do they, do they think about life insurance? Do they think about putting some type of, of trustee in charge of the children down the road? How do you even approach that thought process? Yeah, so there's the financial and then there's the care. Uh, and there's also the care of the finances. So for example, I have a term life insurance policy on me that will expire when the boys are 20, I believe. Oftentimes, whole life is encouraged for kids with special needs or a policy so that the policy is there basically throughout the life of the parent. And then it's a guarantee. The way I figure it is I'm retiring and my portfolio is basically sufficient so that it can support both the boys as well as myself. So they'll inherit my assets or they'll inherit my life insurance policy. Um, and that's where a special needs trust, which can accept money much higher than $100,000 and shield that from being excluded from state aid, for example, is really important because with the special needs trust, you can actually define a trustee who you can instruct to manage the money in the way that you see fit. So, for example, my instructions are to favor passive investing index fund approach and it's up to the trustee basically to make sure that the financial decisions are they're the ones making the decisions on a long term for for the health of the portfolio of the trust okay and that trustee is different from a potential caretaker right so there's as i understand there's there's a distinction here but how did you appoint a particular trustee like how did you find someone that that you trust what did you think about sure. when when you contemplated that there are commercial trustees out there and organizations that um, will be a trustee for a special needs trust and they know the Medicaid rules and they know the, the benefit rules of what money can be spent that won't disqualify a person. So the biggest concern that I had was that I hope that my boys will be independent, that they'll be able to live perhaps in a group home, perhaps with assisted living or through some assistance through the state. Like Ohio has a really good program that will help place multiple kids with disabilities in, it's not really a group home, but it's more like um, a room share. So they'll split a house between two or three people, and then they might have somebody come in on a daily basis to make sure that the house is being maintained and, and that the, everybody is healthy and, and all that. Why would hate? is that my boys would get settled into such a program and then I pass away or something were to happen to me and they inherit either my life insurance policy or the assets in my portfolio. And then because of those assets, because of the inheritance that they get from the passing that of my passing, that they would get kicked out of their home, for example, that would just be very disturbing for them. And it'd be dis it's disturbing for me to think about happening because I didn't have my, my situation lined up. So there are commercial institutions that will do the trustee role. Uh, you can also have, you can basically designate anybody to be your trustee for a special needs trust. Personally, I designated my father if he's um, capable. And then I have a fallback, uh, I have three basically fallbacks who've all been notified that they're on deck to serve as trustee. And rather than go with the professional trustees, I'm allocating money to them so that they can consult um, with a lawyer basically on an annual basis. So rather than spending like a 1% of assets for the professional trustee, and that's, that's typically common of what I've seen, the professional trustees are compensated based off of assets in the portfolio. I went with an approach where I'm having a non-professional trustee but with an allocated amount of money that will support the non-professional to make good decisions. William, this is really incredible information that's frankly hard to find if you don't know where to start. So thank you for kind of sharing that with us. I have two follow-up questions for you. One, you spoke about getting a lawyer and I'm, and I'm curious, how would someone start with that? And then two, also the question of guardianship. I think both of those I would love to get a little bit more input on. Okay, I would very much recommend a lawyer who is a specialist in special needs trusts. 
it is really easy to make a mistake. Even someone who has a lot of experience with family law and general trusts, special needs trusts have have real restrictions both at the federal as well as at the state level. And it's worth finding someone who is a specialist in this case. The lawyer I went with, his entire practice is nothing but special needs trust. And he himself actually has a child with special needs as well. So I was pretty confident in his abilities. There's a certification um, out there that off the top of my head, I don't recall, both for financial planning as well as for lawyers that focus on the unique needs of special needs estate planning, basically. As far as guardianship, yeah, there's a big difference. So trustees manage the money. So they are the ones who are responsible for what comes in and out of the portfolio, as well as how the portfolio is is managed. Guardians are the loving and caring of your child, um, who is actually responsible for raising your child when you are no longer there. They can be the same people. They can be the same person or people. You can also uh, have it be different. So, for example, I mentioned my dad if he's capable, is the number one choice for my trustee. But my parents are somewhat aged um, and they really couldn't keep up with my kids. So for guardianship, that's my first choice is my sister. And uh, my I have a 21-year-old niece who's like a fallback. And then I, have, I start reaching out to uh, my in-laws and friends of the family for third and fourth line guardianships. William, something you mentioned a few minutes ago really surprised me, actually. You said that your term life insurance was ending when your boys were somewhere in the vicinity of 20. But I guess upon reflection, this makes a little more sense that you're at five. You left your job. You've obviously reached five. But but it does strike me that there are more considerations for you on what your five number is than just oh, am I going to use the 4% rule of thumb or the 3.5% rule of thumb? You need to think about these issues of what are my expenses today, but also, I guess, what could they potentially be? And also, further, you're saying you don't want your boys to be in a situation where they get removed from a good situation. I think a, a group home is how you described it, because they get certain assets. Talk us through how you personally thought through your FI number and what additional considerations there were for you and for people who have children with special needs? Yeah, it's a very complex issue. I mean, on one side, my investment horizon isn't until I'm 90. It's until my kids are 90. And that is a much different set of rules. So on on some respects, it makes things easier. For example, A long-term mindset allows me to allocate a higher percentage of my portfolio to to stocks because I know that the volatility, this money isn't going to be something that's needed for 50 years, for example. I mean, there's a pool of money and I don't have to worry about short-term changes in the market because long-term, 100% stocks is fine for that. But there is a big balancing between my own needs and the needs of my children. And that was a really hard decision I had because I came from a really highly compensated employer or employment through my professional career. And walking away from that, when I know that, for example, I was able to sock a 90% savings rate basically into funds that were going to last them their life, that was a much harder decision for me. The other complicating factor for that is, and as I mentioned, that I have a term life insurance policy as opposed to a whole life insurance, a lot of that comfort level, in general, I'd probably recommend a whole life insurance policy for most people because you don't want your own longevity to take away from the support that your kids get when you pass away. For me, I actually had a life insurance policy on my wife that paid out to me. So my plan included the fact that I have a large portion of money from her policy that's already designated going to the boys for their long-term support. Um, So I kind of look at her life insurance policy not as feeding my own retirement, but her life insurance policy is basically funding the boys' long-term financial security. And William, with this special needs trust, is that something that you fund 
at the outset? Can you continue to fund it? Does it come from your estate? Talk me through like the actual structure of that. Yeah, and this is a really important factor. Special needs trusts are super flexible. You can set up rules so that you can restrict how the money comes out. The downside is that they are a trust and people have this mindset that, well, a trust fund baby is someone who's particularly wealthy. Well, the U.S. taxes don't differentiate between a special needs trust and a trust fund baby who's trying to divert taxes or trying to keep the money away from the IRS. So they are both taxed at the highest tax brackets. Well, it's the same set of tax brackets, but the taxes are highly compressed. So they can earn maybe $10,000 before they're into the highest tax bracket. So you really don't want to put your money into a trust until it's absolutely needed. So for me, I would recommend having all your assets outside of the special needs trust and then on death, have the money populate the special needs trust. So basically what you're saying is that you should fund your special needs trust as part of executing your will. Yeah. So you can designate your beneficiary to be, instead of a individual, you can designate your beneficiary to be a trust. So for example, the beneficiary of my IRAs and my 401k and all of my assets basically are designated in my particular case, I have another trust set up. So all my money basically flows to a non-revocable trust. The special needs trusts are super flexible in defining how money can be spent after the money is in there and is being used. The downside is that a special needs trust is a trust and it is applied basically the tax brackets associated with trusts, which are super compressed. For example, money within a trust or money that's held within a trust If you earn more than $9,000, you're into the highest, most tax bracket there is. So you don't want to be populating your special needs trust until it's absolutely necessary so that any earnings you get aren't being taxed at the 35% tax bracket, for example, which leads to a somewhat interesting optimization, which I really recommend people consider. I have almost all of my assets that I'm living off of for my early retirement are coming from my taxable account. My 401k and my IRAs, I'm working on converting to be Roth IRAs right now so that when they are inherited, the bulk of the boys' assets will be held within their special needs trust as Roth IRA assets. So that Roth IRA becomes super beneficial to them Because their tax bracket, even though they're probably never going to be able to meet my earning potential, their tax bracket is going to be at relatively the 35, probably higher percent tax bracket. So if you envision in the future tax the rich and the rich equates to trust fund babies, you can imagine that trusts are going to be higher and higher and higher taxed. So I'm not withdrawing any of my Roth IRA funds. Um, or my 401k funds for my own personal retirement because I'm working on transferring those to my boys when I pass away. So you've basically created the ultimate stretch Roth IRA, man. I love it. So the boys will still have RMDs that they'll have to take out of the Roth, um, which will be held within the trust. And those RMDs, if they're not being used, will, of course, generate income. Um, But just to to slow down on that, I want to highlight it. So RMDs, required minimum distributions, but the RMDs, as I understand it, are based on anticipated life expectancy. And so the thought being, if you have enough in there, in those accounts, if the RMDs don't exceed the anticipated growth, the account will still continue to grow over their lifetime. I mean, it's just, you've really created a perpetual money-making machine. Yeah. I've tried to shelter their assets from taxes just as well as I've tried to shelter my own. William, I wanted to kind of double back to something. You had mentioned earlier that your wife was the one who did the the finances or at least the the tactical aspect of it. And obviously many of us have to consider a situation where, like in my case, I do all the finances for my family. 
I mean, my wife is a CPA. She's perfectly qualified, but it just how we've distributed this in the house. It just falls that I do. I do the finances, but I've been mindful of thinking about like legacy binders and, and instructions. Was this something that had crossed your mind years ago? How did this work for you? So the answer is that we didn't really plan on that. It was perhaps blind optimism, but we never, when Amber was going through chemo and going through cancer therapy, we never kind of went to the negative side, which was kind of an oversight, but it was also kind of needed in order to keep kind of, yeah, we were always focused on long-term, okay, when this is done, what are we going to be doing and things like that. So we never really went into the the dark place. And it really hurt me when we, when I actually had, when that eventuality actually did occur, because I had to basically reverse engineer a lot of her procedures. So thankfully I was her IT person in the household. So the division of responsibilities, she may have handled the the money, but I handled the IT so that it was not a hard task for me to get access to her email. And then from her email, I was able to get account access everywhere I needed to. Nowadays, I very much recommend spouses give some thought. It doesn't have to be related to a terminal disease. Just just give some thought about if your spouse isn't available to do some of those tasks, can you make sure that you can do them as well? And things like LastPass or other password managers where you can share a set of passwords so that between more than just one individual is absolutely critical, I believe. So as well as identifying just like what accounts you have. One of the things that occurred to me after Amber had passed is that I at least knew what accounts we had because although she may have managed the bills, we were kept, we both had regular conversations about money and I knew where everything was. If something were to happen to me, I don't have somebody right now who has all that information just because they share finances with me. So I started a Google Drive document, and I've shared that with my parents and as well as my sister, as well as everybody who's on the kind of sequence of trustee about what all accounts I have, where they are. I have no passwords because all my passwords are stored in LastPass, but things like credit cards, especially if you're doing something like travel credit cards and you're either um, cycling through and have a new card every six months or so, knowing what all active accounts you have is critical and having that be information that can be picked up by somebody else. William, this is never an easy conversation. I mean, it's not honestly easy for me to ask you about it. And it certainly would not have been easy for you to talk about with Amber in the moment. But with the benefit of hindsight, would you advise people to do something differently? Is there a way to talk about it in that situation without clearly focusing on the negative? Obviously, you, you didn't want to focus on the negative, right? You wanted to think long term. But like, have you have you thought about how you possibly could have navigated that so you weren't just reverse engineering it? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is this is something that spouses should be doing even outside of a terminal disease, because, you know, life is a terminal disease. We're all going to die eventually. And more than likely, you'll have one spouse that outlives the other spouse. And so this is something that all spouses should be doing and be thinking about, like, okay, the division responsibility is currently this, but my partner needs to know taxes as well. I mean, my your partner needs to know house maintenance as well. I mean, they don't necessarily have to be the one doing it, but they should be capable of knowing what has been done and how to move things forward if need be. And that was that was something that we really didn't do a great job of personally, but I recommend with hindsight, everybody who I know to to make that those type of changes. That's really valuable advice. And I hope that people will follow through on that. I I have one additional question for you with regards to life insurance and finding out how much you need there. And there's a couple different ways that I hope you take this, but I wanted to point out one thing earlier. that's very interesting on this show. We talk a lot about term life insurance and for most people in most situations, I think term life insurance is the clear winner, but I don't think that that's necessarily the situation we're talking about in your case. And you mentioned some of the benefits of whole life. 
And you may have hit on one of the few times that I think whole life may be beneficial. I'd love for you to really highlight that difference. And then two, determining how much you need. What are your thoughts on, on not overdoing it? Or can you get too much life insurance? On the decision between term and whole, it, it's still a tricky situation. So for the general population, the people who are not part of the fire community, whole certainly has a lot of advantages because one thing we know is that the parent's going to eventually die. And if the the whole life policy is funded and it's kept funded through their life, then their child will have funds that they can use to stretch them through their life. The decision within people within the fire community can kind of pivot that or can kind of shift that because they generally have better self-control or at least self-awareness of where their money is and can focus on perhaps setting up investments that will benefit their child long term. So for me, we had our term life policy set up before the diagnosis of autism for the boys with the idea that as we got close, then we might want to shift some portion of our policy into a whole life policy to fund the special needs trust for the kids. That ended up not being something that was needed because of Amber's life insurance policy basically being directed for them. But yeah, I mean, it, in general, your situation is if you don't have somebody who depends on your income, then you really don't need to be insured. And so that's where term life actually benefits because as you get older, you have more of your own assets, your kids move out, and you don't have that dependency relationship. When you have kids with special needs, they're going to be kind of dependent on your assets and your income for a lot of their lifetime. And so that's where, you know, there's never really going to be a time where you're no longer having that level of support for your children. So that's where a, a whole life policy can actually make a lot of sense. How do you determine how much you need, how much, how much insurance you need? You know, so in the case of term life insurance, maybe a $500,000 policy for 20 years, et cetera, et cetera. What are your thoughts on picking the right amount? Yeah. So there's two actual audiences that should be aware of. So there's the audience of people with um, kids with special needs, but then there's also the general FI audience and there's two answers for each of those. So four answers total. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I want to point out is I had a policy on Amber she, and I had a policy on myself when our kids were born or soon before our kids were born, we started our policies. The idea being that if something were to happen to me, I'll see um, my life insurance policy. I was the main breadwinner or income earner for the household. So that policy would fund the lifestyle associated with raising the kids and Amber being able to focus on the kids. We put a life insurance policy on Amber because the realization was I probably wouldn't be able to continue my career in the same way if I was having to deal with all, well, deal with childcare as well as all the therapies associated with kids with autism or other special needs. So she had a policy. I had a policy. We probably over purchased on her policy from the outset because one thing that we didn't consider is the fact that there is social security benefits for widows since the children are minors they're actually able to draw social security benefits off of amber's work history so they actually had money coming in to them which helped fund their own nanny care so that wasn't money that actually had to come out of life insurance policy well, it covered about half of my nanny care bill for the years while I was working after she passed away. In addition to the survivor benefits from Social Security, some of the expenses that I thought I had a really good job. I mean, I, they were super flexible and I was basically able to juggle my various obligations even after Amber passed, my job, my employer was super flexible about me making, taking off time in order to take the boys to the doctors and things like that. So I didn't have to quit work when Amber passed away. And actually, indeed, I spent another five years in my career after she passed away and was able to make it work. On the other side, 
that was advice I would give somebody who have who has kids. I mean, to to think about do you really need to have the same amount of protection for on your spouse, or will things like Social Security benefits take care of some of those extra expenses that you might be incurring on kids with special needs? And again, my term life insurance policies were set up before the boys had their diagnosis. I would certainly say don't underestimate how much you might need when you have kids with special needs because they have therapy sessions. And for a lot of jobs that aren't flexible or aren't as flexible as mine, it's a big stretch to walk away from work at three because you've got therapy appointments at 3.30, for example, or just the not being able to attend all hands meetings or do travel because you're a single parent. There is a lot of potential need for that additional amount of money. So it's a balancing act. I'm not sure I can give you a number. We chose numbers that we were comfortable with that were multiples of my salary and we applied the same amount on me as we did for her. So it was, if we didn't have kids with special needs, it was probably too much with the boys and their circumstances. It was, um, I'm glad that we did as much as we did. Well, the other thing that's incredible about your story, William, is that you reached financial independence and you were able to step away. And and actually it's kind of one of those interesting things that your job was really an awesome job that you love. This is not a situation where you hated your job, but you walked away and you, and you pulled the the trigger on early retirement. Tell us a little bit about that decision. Yeah. So my late wife and I, we were always planning an early retirement, but that was an early retirement in our early fifties and not mid forties. Technically I became financially independent and could retire early the day she died and I qualified for her life insurance. It's the worst possible way of achieving financial independence and not something I would recommend. However, I really was enjoying my job. I mean, I I was working work that I really was engaged with. After you've gone through a loss of a loved one, you're just not, you. I kind of called it um, like Swiss cheese brain. I mean, I couldn't hold a thought um, in my head, and I really was distracted for for months. And my employer was super chill. I actually took a Family Medical Leave Act because I just couldn't focus. And after I came back, I was it's kind of like in recovery um, from bereavement, but it was still it wasn't my best work. By the time one year got through, I was actually back into feeling like I was kind of caught my groove back. And I was enjoying work again. I'd shifted within the company to a different division, and I was I was super engaged. I was also engaged and becoming more and more engaged in the fire community. And I mean, a lot of it was a matter of everything has opportunity costs. So I was still enjoying myself working, but I really was also cognizant of the fact that, you know, I had two weeks of vacation a year, a week of that would be spent between um, visiting my in-laws and my family for holidays that left basically a week of real vacation time I could spend with my kids. And that just wasn't, that wasn't enough. That wasn't, I was feeling like I was a really good employee at the time, but not delivering up to the standards of being a good dad. So that's where early retirement actually surfaced where You know, I could be enjoying my time, the limited time I have with my kids when they're young or youngish, rather than being so focused on work. And even though my employer was super supportive of me having flexible time, when I would take one of my sons to therapy, for example, and have to cut out a couple hours early, just my own sense of work ethic meant that I was, I'd come back put the boys to bed and then I'd make up that time. It really wasn't requested, but I also, I mean, I I had this sense of, you know, I, I wasn't able to kind of step away and say, you know, that was enough. That was a good day of work because that didn't seem like a good day of work for me. Um, I had my own kind of set of standards that I wasn't meeting. So William, you left your job in the, in the past year, but as you said, 
under the most unfortunate of circumstances, you reached Phi about five years ago. So there's an intervening time there of, of four plus years where you continue to work at your employer. And obviously you just painted a, a wonderful picture of what that experience was like, but what actually caused you to leave that job? I understand. And again, you, you painted the picture, but was there a point in time where you said, okay, this is it? Or was there a specific issue that arose? Like clearly it wasn't, oh, I reached Phi, I'm out because you had already reached Phi years ago. Like talk me through what actually shifted that, that made you leave your job. Yeah. So as you mentioned, I mean, the, the finances side really wasn't the determining factor of when I left employment from corporate America. The first year or so, I didn't want to make any changes after Amber had passed away, simply because you're not in a good frame of mind to make those type of big decisions. So I'd recommend anyone who's gone through any kind of loss, whether that's loss of parents, a loss of a child, loss of a spouse, not to make any immediate kind of pivots in your life that are hard to walk back from. So for the first year in my life, I pretty much stayed with the same department. I, I tried to keep my life pretty much on inertia. The the paths I was heading on and the procedures I had and like the, I mean, I tried to keep everything as much as I could about the same general direction. After I got out of the immediate bereavement period, I started making pivots. And so I became familiar with the fire movement. Investing became a big aspect or personal finance became a, a bigger and bigger kind of not just interest, but an actual downright hobby slash pastime. I found myself more and more spending time actually helping on Choose FI. I guess I discovered Choose FI 2017, uh, 2016. And yeah, I started spending more time helping you guys initially with the vault, but then it became um, helping on the Facebook group. When I would idle at work, I would be, well, I found myself goofing off. And when I was goofing off, what I was doing was working in fire communities, <laughs> um, choose FI and other Facebook groups. It kind of was a, a light bulb moment of, you know, the things that I'm doing when I goof off are probably the things that I'm more interested in doing than what I am doing when I'm actually goofing off. So another big factor, and it was act I actually credit it in a large part, the Scott Trench episode with Bigger Pockets, where he pretty much through through just a set of circumstances was in contact with the founders of Bigger Pockets and then defined himself a role that he thought he would be qualified to work in. That actually provided a lot of inspiration for me to reach out with you guys and say, hey, is there a need or do you see a way that I could provide value into the Choose FI community? And you literally created your own position. I mean, that that was the part about it that was so incredible. And and I mean, what you're doing and the way you've been able to help us bring this to, together is just, I mean, I think our community will appreciate it more and more over the next year or so. But it, it's just, it's really been cool to see basically you embracing almost this entrepreneurial lifestyle. I know I get a message from you like every couple of days with a new idea of something that you're pursuing. And it strikes me that like before you were taking your 23 some odd years of, of software engineer experience and you were funneling it into a corporation's goals. And now you're being able to take that. And it's obviously something that you're passionate about and you care about and you enjoy, and you're funneling it either into a passion project like ours or into your own ideas. And, and it's just, it's really, really fun to kind of watch you find and pursue these new passions and interest. Yeah, it's kind of funny. So, I mean, I consider myself a programmer. I, I don't, programming wasn't just my profession. It's part of who I am. And it's, it's kind of like an artist. I mean, not saying that I was like an artist level, but they might get paid for their art, but at some point, even if they weren't paid, that part of their identity is in what they're pursuing or what they're doing. I enjoy creating software or, or systems, and the, the way that I create those systems are, are in software. I, I, I am a programmer. I enjoy programming. So in the nearly 20 years, I guess it was technically 18 years that I was with my former employer, I had 
maybe half a dozen projects that I was able to release to the public that actually saw some some visibility to the greater community. And yeah, and since I quit, I'm able to actually all my effort can go into either building something cool for choose FI or building something cool or following up on ideas of my own or contributing to open source or or these other ways that I can continue to to build cool things, but it's cool things of my own choosing as opposed to things that although my job was very helpful to the internet at large, I believe. It just no one ever saw that the, that uh, the stuff that I worked on. So it was, yeah, I've been really enjoying this change. Yeah, William, I know I can say personally that I'm I'm so glad that you can pursue your passion of coding and the Choose FI community and the FI community at large are stronger because you're a part of it. So a, a huge thank you for me personally. Well, it's been a pleasure. Well, on most shows, that would be the end of the episode. But William, on this show, we would love to give you the chance to tackle the hot seat. Are you ready for this? Yes, very much so. In a world drowning in debt and rampant consumption, trapped by the chains of lifestyle inflation, these questions highlight the secrets of those who have broken free. Welcome to the Choose FI Hot Seat. William, question number one, your favorite blog. Okay. I'm going to actually give you two. From on a financial side, I am a huge fan of the Nerd's Eye View from Michael Kitches. And he goes into a lot of in-depth analysis on, yeah, on a variety of financial topics, um, as well as how to manage like a financial services company and just a lot of great content there. And then on a more kind of non-financial side, I really love uh, Wait But Why. Um, it's a long form essays on just random topics. Most recently, they had a really good one on um, how to choose a career, which I thought was some of viewers would actually like to read. I swear, Brad, this show is sending Wait But Why a lot of traffic. That is quickly becoming a fan favorite. Yeah, it's pretty much every guest at this point says Wait But Why is their favorite blog. So it sounds like something I need to personally add to my rotation. I, I go there quite often, but I just I don't have it on my uh, Feedly program. So that's something I'm going to need to add. All right. Question number two, William, your favorite article of all time. OK, so I'd love to just say the safe withdrawal rate series on early retirement now. But that's actually like a 27 part <laughs> episode. Why pick one when you uh, can pick 28? <laughs> <laughs> There's actually one article in particular, the um, why retirement is harder than saving for retirement that I thought was really good. And it came out just as I was kind of pivoting and making my own decisions of leaving. It was actually came out, I think, actually in the first month of me leaving employment. But it focuses on how the path to early retirement is actually a, an easier path. And it's certainly a lot more flexible than the actual decision. And when you're actually in early retirement, where the downsides are a lot more precarious. And on on outside of financial side, um, on Wait But Why, there's a really great article um, called 100 Blocks a Day. And basically, the author points out that your waking period of time is basically equivalent to 100 blocks or a 10 by 10 grid. And each block is 10 minutes and how you fill that block and whether you are productive or whether you're goofing off, it's up to you to decide how you live that life and awake time. So, so yeah, I really like that as just a way to reframe visually the amount of time that you have in your day. All right, William, question number three, your favorite life hack. I would say stoicism. I am a practicing stoic and stoicism gets a kind of a bad rap. It's, it's often associated with just frugality or just being able to to put up with um, cold showers, living with less. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Like cold showers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, I really do think that the the lessons of some of the early Stoic philosophers are, are really still applicable to the modern age. Things like accepting 
things for the way they are, not necessarily the way that you might have envisioned them to be. I mean, especially with life, everybody has ups and downs and the ability to actually like, you know, my life now is not the way that I envisioned it would be 10 years ago, but you have to kind of accept it for what it is. And as far as finances, as far as kind of life mentality, stoicism has a lot to offer. All right. Question number four, your biggest financial mistake. When Amber and I moved from Texas to Ohio, that really would have been a perfect time for me to have taken off the training wheels that I had established with Ed Jones and take control of our financial future moving forward. And I didn't do that. And I think that really was my biggest mistake. It certainly was my most costly mistake. All right, William, question number five, the advice you would give your younger self. I certainly do not want to cause any time paradoxes. So. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Um, a lot of those things. I mean, I'm pretty happy with my life that I have right now. So outside of things like that, I would say when we moved to Ohio, we didn't sign up the boys for the Medicaid waiver program. That really was a mistake. At the time we were like, you know, we have great benefits through my employer and we really Medicaid was something that is for, for people who don't have the financial resources. We had the financial resources. So we never really engaged with the disability department of our county. And we never signed the boys up for the waiver. And and really what I didn't know at the time is that the waiver programs in Ohio, at least, um, are specifically wavering the requirement that you be financially poor. And it's meant for for people who are who are disabled. And that was something that just didn't occur to me. Even it's embedded in the name that the requirement for Medicaid support isn't necessarily something that I was cheating the system by applying for the waiver. The waivers are intended to help people who have disabilities. And so I guess that would be the advice I would say is don't think about things in terms of like, It's not about you. It's about your kids. That's really incredible advice. And I got to think that as a community, the body of information that this community has aggregated is better because you're part of it. I mean, this, this information is so critical to get out there and spread as far as possible. So thank you for being willing to share it. Uh, We do have a bonus question for you. What is the purchase that you've made over the past 12 months that has brought the most value to your life? I actually have two. So one is something that's so new to my life that it's hard for me to to actually give it the full fledged endorsement. But uh, just about two weeks ago, I bought a 4K monitor and it's been great. Uh, I love the increased amount of real estate and it's just been a made programming and going down and working on projects just a, a complete joy. There's a lot of people who probably aren't programmers. So I would say um, before that monitor purchase, it would have been a, an actual Japanese kitchen knife. So it's a vegetable cleaver. And I'll make sure that you have the information on where to get it. And it just, I enjoy cooking and it it goes through vegetables like you would not believe. It's super thin. So it will cut through like a butternut squash, like super fast. And it's just been great. There is a butternut squash soup in my kitchen right now that my wife made, but I'm doing a fast today. And I I was so disappointed when she showed it to me. I was like, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> 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 to everyone in our community, normally I, I, you know, I ask the guests, you know, where can people find you? You can find William on our Facebook group or on our website or anywhere on choose FI. He is honestly, he's helping us build this from the ground up. It's really just, I can't express to you how lucky and privileged we are to have him as part of the team. And even more than that, if you listen to the depth of the content that was covered in this episode, I mean, you need to realize that this is like one tiny little aspect of the the different ideas and concepts that he has locked down. And so what we've actually asked is if William can join us occasionally on our Friday roundups to help us source and work through very technical questions. And so we will kind of roll that out going into 2019, but he's always around on the website and on the Facebook group, but he's also going to be a recurring figure on this podcast. And so William, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your story today. Oh, I certainly enjoyed it. Brad, this episode, man, this is probably one of the most important episodes that possibly that we've ever covered. 
not because it's going to affect everybody, but because it affects somebody, you know, at their core. And it's so hard to parse this information and bring it all together and apply it to a FI framework. That's what William helped us do. Yeah. And William has spent years researching this and he's, he's the guy, he has this information and he passed it along so clearly today. And yeah, just a huge thank you to him. And like you mentioned, I can't wait to have him on future Friday roundups. He has just a wealth of knowledge on pretty much every technical subject in the world of Fi and outside the world of Fi, honestly. So he, he's just a tech guy. It's really amazing. So yeah, many, many future episodes with William on it and certainly looking forward to future episodes. All right, my friends, if you got value from today's episode, if you've been getting value from the episodes up to this point, just take one second and press the subscribe button on the platform you're listening to this on. It just lets the providers know you're getting value from the show and you want to be here when we produce additional content. If you want to support us and what we're doing here at Choose a Fi, here are four easy ways. One, leave us an iTunes review. To do that, just go to chooseify.com slash iTunes. Two, use our page to sign up for travel credit cards. If you want to travel the world with miles and points instead of your hard-earned dollars, then just go to chooseify.com slash cards and get started today. Three, if you're working on the milestones of Fi, set up a personal capital account to track your progress and use our affiliate link. It's completely free and just go to chooseify.com slash PC. P is in Paul, C is in Cap. And four, and most importantly, find your friends, coworkers, and family members who might be open to this message and tell them about the podcast. Have them start with episode 100. It is a fantastic starting place. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.